Uh, I'd like to start to acknowledge that I live on Karna, a brand new country, but I work on Wodjak, Ungar country. At the moment, though, I'm in the Northwest of Australia, working with the Balangara, uh, a brilliant corporation, and we are visiting Gigi Dolbong countries in this lovely part of our Australia. I also want to thank the organizer of the 16th International Conference on the Arts and Society for inviting me here today. I really appreciate that. The session, Voices from the Edges, uh, negotiating the local and the global, wishes to highlight how, and I quote, quote, traditional societies of artistic production, consumption, and display are continuing to be contested of waves of digital media, culture, and commerce, and how these forms of contestants are causing rearrangements given rise to new art forms, media, and venues from digital spaces to galleries to the street. Such culture appropriation have raised Australian Aboriginal issues about indigenous culture and intellectual property rights, which I'm going to talk about today. Local voices asking for awareness about centuries of colonial impact on the life worlds and how wrongs, many wrongs sometimes, can turn into rights. Another focus of this conference is how, and I quote again, cultural institutions such as museums and galleries play a role in the larger projects of community formation, nation building, global politics, and how artistic production interprets these culture flows and responds to the new institutionalized spaces. End of quote. My presentation here today will try to demonstrate this perspective. It takes the starting point in some community-based rock art research I conducted over the past years in Western Arnhem Land, in what is known today as the Capital National Park. Thanks to the thorough guidance of the Aboriginal tradition owners of several clans, which I work with, my research has undergone a dramatic drastic change. To begin with, my research was focused on Aboriginality as a cultural expression viewed from an ethic perspective of an outsider. As a result, I asked a lot of questions. Nowadays, I'm involved in picturing the life and legacy of specific Aboriginal artists working in the traditional media of rock art and how these can reveal a more culture sensitive understanding of the colonial impact on the life worlds. I learned to listen. Here I wish to touch upon how a community-based approach can help bring back some stories from the internet, private and national and global culture institutions, archives, museum, researcher, past and present, to empower indigenous groups and voices today. In general, Western Arnhem Land and its stunning rock art have been observed, documented, and researched since the first European explorers, in this case for almost 200 years. Today, rock art is actively used to lure visitors to Kakadu National Park and some shows and rock art sites that are open to public visitation by hundreds and thousands of people each year. Tourist companies and the National Park use these artworks to lure visitors to come and, I quote, explore ancient rock art, site of the world's oldest continuing culture. And of course, that's it's right in, its, in one way, but it's also plays around a little bit with how Aboriginal people understand that. And internet is often the gate for a visit. Now we'll start my presentation there. So if you, for instance, enter the keyword rock art and Kakadu National Park, you will end up with more than 550,000 hits and pictures of some of the most stunning ancient rock art in the world. But is it so? We will start to explore that here now by sharing my presentation with you. And I will try to find my PowerPoint. Sorry for this. So here is some of the artwork of the artist I will uh, explore with you today and talk about Nayon Bumi. We will meet in short, within in short. So by the first hundred images I encountered when I did this search on Google, 
I've found more than six known rock art artists, and I didn't look very carefully, including Narlin, Charlie Whittaker, Nayan Bomi, Jim Gore, Bluey Ilkier, and Gulich. And more than 100 of these rock art images I've found is created by the single artist, Nayan Bomi. Now, internet is interesting because among these images, we also find many private company, private persons that are trying to make a buck on these artworks including the most famous rock art site in Kakadu National Park and probably in Australia, the Ang Bang Bang Gallery. It was painted over a long time period and many time, and also by the artist who made the latest uh, contribution to this panel, uh, Nayon Bomi and his friend, Old Nimgor. They painted more than 90 images that you see here, including men and women and mythological beings including the famous uh, Namagon up to the left, who is associated with the wet season and, and uh, the thunder and lightning that comes during this period. These images was painted in 1963 or early 1964, late 1963, 1964. And um, if you go through the images that you encounter on the internet, you will find this private company trying to make a uh, uh, about for selling this stunning artwork in form of, for instance, uh, uh, a, a picture, framed pictures here of this artwork. So uh, this is a painting made by Blue Ilkier, uh, probably in the night, 1950s, um, that's still there. And um, only a handful of all images you encounter on this search is actually older than 200 years on the first encounter with European uh, travelers and explorers. Here's this uh, one of Nagumi's painting that are sold and it's funny enough, um, um, uh, sold for uh, quite a decent amount of money. Uh, you can also make wall art of these artworks or you can make it pushing and put in your, and your, in your, uh, in your sofa, in your living room, you can make teacups and yeah, the, it's an endless market when you start to explore these home pages of these artworks. And what's interesting here is that in Australia, a brilliant art have been protected by um, culture um, and property laws since 1967. The first court case was in 1966. But funny enough, this doesn't extend into the rock art media because uh, it's thought that this was not made by artists that are known by name. So it's a kind of culture curtain uh, that have been put in front of these artworks and that there should be no authorship here. And as I would want to present here today, that is far from the case. Um, and those, uh, artworks also extend into uh, other things like postcard. Here's some postcard and uh, images the nine women made, or a tea towel. And it's an it's a long, long list that I won't go through with you here today. When when I uh, uh, encounter his artworks in different forms, but it's not only private persons and, and companies that want to make uh, uh, use of this. It's also extending to a uh, um, more uh, official institution. Uh, rock art researcher using this artwork to promote their uh, books is just a sample of our about 40 uh, um, uh, books that have his artworks on the front page, but also the cultural institution. So even the Aboriginal Areas Protection Authority started to use his artworks to begin with, without any uh, consideration about the artists behind our art. And as you see in the coat of arms of the Northern Territory in Australia, a centerpiece of that is also taken from the Ang Bang Bang Gallery that was painted in 1963 and 64. And uh, even on the the essential commemoration note from 1988, uh, the $10 note, in the background to the left here, you see one of his uh, female images that is from his home, Badmadi country, uh, clan country, uh, that ended up on the note here. Uh, suspiciously thought that 
this was just an artwork known that was made thousands and thousands of years. And uh, we don't know exactly when this one was no made, but it certainly was was during uh, Nayan Bumi's lifetime uh, between 1895 uh, and 1967. But here's the artist himself in one of the last photo I uh, uh, encounter of him. Now, to picture the life and legacy of a traditional rock art artist has never been done before many times because of when the colonial uh, um, powers came into a uh, different indigenous society, rock art started to, uh, stopped to be made in different ways. And they were not always interested in the artist, even if sometimes they were interested in their artworks. So when I started this research some years ago, there was not a single photo known of this man. And but there were some information about him. And I will try to uh, give you a sense of how uh, intriguing and exciting and how difficult it is to actually reconstruct the life uh, of a traditional Aboriginal artist in our Australia. Um, and my journey started be, by working with uh, Jeffrey Lee uh, from Jock Clan that today is one of the custodians of the Anbang Bang Gallery and one of the areas, one of the eight clan areas where Nayambomi painted, that we know he painted in, uh, a, in his lifetime. Jeffrey Lee is most famous because he stopped the uh, Kongara uh, Iranian mine on his country and fought a long battle against uh, uh, the mining company until 2014, he could include the Kongara lease into Kakadu National Park and protect, protect his clan area for uh, the future uh, to be enjoyed in, in a more traditional way. So in 2000, uh, five years ago, we started to have a project. And one of the concerns that Jeffrey Lee had is that a lot of information about his clan and in the area where he lived and work um, has been dispatched into different uh, colonial uh, museums and archives and, and different things. So he asked me to help him to bring back these stories to his country in different ways. And I just gonna give you some example here and now today about how this has played out in relation to uh, Nayambomi. But as I said in the beginning, in this clan area, there are more than eight known uh, uh, rock art artists that have been painted. And we've been trying to make a biography of all these artists and their lives and families and uh, to bring back some stories to this rock art that was made during the last hundred years. So, what can characterize this is a kind of fragmentation. So we have gold diggers, dingo scalpers, rock art researchers, cattle stations, timber milling, missionaries, crocodile hunters, buffalo shooters, archaeologists, armies, and so on, that had been in Kakadu the last, during uh, the lifetime of Nayambomi. And each of them have encountered him, and he had encountered them, and they have interacted in different ways. So you can find a photo here, you can find a footnote there, you can uh, find some uh, interesting stories uh, in, taken down by different uh, uh, agents that have been there. Uh, and it's a very time consuming and, but also entertaining and very interesting um, uh, project because by picturing his life, we also get a story of what happened in Kakadu from the first uh, encounters with Europeans up to the referendum in 1967, when Aboriginal people started to be uh, accepted as, as civilians in Australia. So here's, for instance, one of the first photo, the oldest photo I've got from him on him that we found during uh, the research. It's taken 19. 26 at the Owen Pelle mission and uh, Nayan Boom is sitting with a spear in his uh, joints and he'd been uh, doing a traditional spear fight called uh, Bong Bol uh, this, uh, this ceremony and uh, he was accused for sorcery and probably they had had something to do with his young wife that he was visiting in Owen Pelle station with so they were a traditional a little bit uh, 
a fight and who takes a photo. And in the background, you see one of his brothers has been key for this research, uh, Capriki. Uh, in 1930, he encountered the famous Australian explorer, uh, Francis Bertels, that made a lot of books and films about the outback of Australia. And here you see um, Noah Nyambom is sitting on the back of, his pa of a painted car, uh, Francis Bertels' car. He has a magpie goose in his knee, Francis Bertels, and his dog Yu is sitting there. And Nyambom is sitting on a kangaroo newly uh, killed. And his dog is reaching down, and it's interesting on this one. And all these paintings here on the car, all together, I think 18 of them, was painted by Naimbomi in the wet season of 1930. He painted everything, walls, barks, um, cars, and, and so on. And at about this time, before and after, he also worked in gold mines, and you can find some photos of the shaft he worked with in the boiling process and things of that. And it's funny enough, there are also some oral history of uh, Aboriginal people telling stories of the life condition in these camps that can be helped to uh, picture his life. Uh, for a long time, uh, from the Great War up, all the way up to the 1960s, he was engaged in different buffalo shooting uh, and, and dangers. And usually they are not mentioned in any record, they are bringing co-workers to this uh, uh, enterprise. But here you see him to the right, he was working as a skinner. And that can be important a little bit later on. Uh, so here he's been identified by his uh, uh, granddaughter uh, in the photo that he's been working with. He was also a crocodile hunter from time to time. And he worked in a timber mill. And we managed to get a photo of the timber mill, even if we don't have a photo of him working in the timber mill. And um, he was also uh, reenacting different ancient stories in ceremonies and dances and song together with uh, his, uh, uh, his brothers and so on. And here you see him uh, uh, standing with a didgeridoo. Now he's standing holding a didgeridoo with a painting over his chest uh, in the center of the photo. Um, and that's, this was way both to educate young Aboriginal people, but also educate uh, outsiders about the power and uh, beauty of Aboriginal culture, I guess. He, some of the tourists even took a photo of one of the bark shelter he used during this time. And now we're up in the 19, late 1950s. And um, even anthropologists dropped by now and then and made movies about uh, ceremonies. And here you see him in the background holding clapstick and doing the rhythm for the singer and the dancer. So we have some moving uh, pictures. Uh, where we can uh, capture his life. And um, even Devon Attenborough visited his country and the Anbangbang Gallery. Uh, just before it was painted the last time uh, and had a chat with uh, Nayan Bumi and other fellows. And he also made bark paintings for uh, tourists. And we think that started already in the uh, late 1910s but it's not until the 1960s when the art market kicked off in Australia that we actually have his name on his artwork. Sometimes you can picture him by his style, which is interesting. But in this case, this uh, painting here to the left is now in Munich and we find them in Houston, we find them in New York, we find them in Japan and in different cities in Australia, in private collections uh, and at, at this point, I have about 20 bark paintings that have been brought together almost from 15 different places. So we can get a hint of his artworks in this media. He is standing to the right in the middle in one of the paintings he made with his fellow Jim and Gore, you see to the left. And here's the last photographs when he was taking down some note with the uh, Lance Bennett uh, and they were incorporated in book uh, in 1969 that was only printed in Japanese. So some of his artworks ended up in Japan after this interview. 
when he was sitting and uh, he passed away about seven months after this last photo was taken. So, um, but it, his story doesn't end there. Just 15 years after he painted at uh, Ambangbang, it, the first conservation work to, to save his artworks was taken part. And uh, soon thereafter, the rock art researchers started to get interested in of this prolific artist. And in the middle here, you see his young brother, who was in the early photo, Nipa Capariki, working together with Paul Tasson and George Chaluka, two famous rock art uh, research colleagues uh, that have been working in the area in the 70s and 80s and up to the, today. Most importantly, these two fellows, Ivan Haskwich and Hilary Sullivan, in the late 80s made some fantastic work in sitting down with his family and friends. They saw Nyambomi painted in different parts of Kakadu National Park and took down stories and started to list his artworks. And they came up with an astonishing list of, of, uh, of artworks. So he painted at 46 places that people have seen him painting, uh, a sum of 604 rock art figures in seven clan areas, there are more today, in an area that encompasses 1,800 square kilometers. So it's a quite a journey to actually revisit this place and, and see how his artworks prevailing today. So he's been coined uh, the most prolific known rock art artist in the world. There are probably people that have painted more than him, but we don't have the name and numbers on, the, on them, so to say. Uh, so by bringing all this information together uh, to a single story, uh, it's an ongoing process and I hope to finish a kind of biography over this old man within short. But during this process, because most of the fantastic things happen, there are still people around. He passed away more than 55 years ago, or 55, four years ago, and there's still people remember him uh, as an elder artist in the traditional uh, Aboriginal uh, communities. And so through this artwork, this project with uh, Jeffrey Lee, we get in contact with this little girl here to the left, Gimma Gore's daughter. Uh, she, he, she called uh, Nayum Bomi grandfather. And she was actually at the place here today. Uh, you see her to the left. When this painting was done in the, the um, uh, 1963, 1964, she can point out what she was sleeping. She can remember what they were eating. She was helping this old man when they were climbing up on a stick that you saw in an earlier photo and make this painting. The top of this uh, fellow you see here in the, in the middle is actually six, seven meters high up. And uh, she also recognized a lot of images that was not taken down in the 1980s when they made the interviews with uh, the men in the, in the tribes that remember him. Uh, so we actually extended the number of images that Nayumbomi painted up to close to 700 today with her help. And here is Yossi today when she explained one of the images she saw this old man uh, painting when she was about 12, 13 years old. And this is a, a spiritual figure. They have a lot of connotation even today in, 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 in traditional Aboriginal cultures. And uh, she explained that this old man was singing and painting and educating him how, her, uh, how to behave so this kind of vicious uh, spiritual uh, being should not uh, be visiting her at different points in her life. So the artwork was a kind of educational tool for the young kids uh, in the society. And interesting enough, she, uh, he told her that her, his father had been telling the same story to her and she, he was in the same age by painting the same images but in another place in the landscape. And so this is the continuing tradition that actually prevails even today in, in, in a strong way in Western Ireland land. And this one, this is very interesting then when we get the grasp of a traditional artist in such a number of painting is that 
what you see here in front of you is the only two images we have out of 700 that uh, actually tell a story about the encounter with the outside, mostly Europeans in this case. A goat here to the left and a scene from a buffalo hunting camp to the right, an agitated uh, man made in beeswax holding a skin and knife and a, and a rifle shooting a buffalo. Otherwise, they are the 698 images and uh, still counting, uh, are all made in a kind of tradition that we can follow at least a few, the last few thousand years in, in the area of Western Army land. And this use of art as an educational tool for Aboriginal uh, youngster also transcend into us uh, outsiders as myself, anthropologists, archeologists, tourists, art dealers, where Aboriginal people actively have used their culture knowledge and their artistic uh, expressions to actually educate us uh, about the richness and beauty of Aboriginal culture. Something that's going on even today, as I said. Uh, here you have a painting of Robert Nabajik. Uh, that was taught by uh, an old artist that was actually taught by Nayumbomi and we can see some resemblance of the ladies we saw in the, in the beginning from the Ambang Bang and from the $10 note that is still the same story that are taken down generation after generation. And also in murals, as you see here to the left, some of his artwork is transcendent today and used in different media, in different terms. And when we do our rock art uh, recordings and research and bringing this story back, we still encounter new images uh, made by Nayan uh, that we, with some certainty, can say was made by him in different, uh, at different places. So these 46 places that was known uh, in 1980s in the late, we now up to closer to 50 places. And as you see, this is an urgency to revisit this place because some of them are made in really uh, vulnerable places, uh, exposed to sun and water and animals rubbing on them. So uh, if you want to contribute to actually uh, saving this art and the knowledge that goes with it, you can all visit Rock Art Our Australia and um, help uh, continue the work of uh, uh, exploring this, uh, this media and what it means today in Aboriginal culture in different ways. And I will stop sharing my PowerPoint here and have some final notes to make before we can let the word out. So the mention shift in my perception of these artworks can be demonstrating, um, no, Sorry, my presentation here has highlighted the need to readdress indigenous culture and intellectual property rights in relation to the most prolific known rock art artist in the world, Nayan Bomi. Today's copyright laws is protecting people who are seizing Nayan Bomi's artworks by a photograph or putting it on a, uh, a postcard and selling these for a profit. And this cultural appropriation is actually legal uh, because it's made in a media uh, that uh, is not recognized as uh, in, in the law, in this case, cables. Uh, but these artworks on, on uh, bark media is actually uh, covered by this law. But it's far from fair to do so, I would say. And we need to address this in, an, in the 21st century in, in a more thorough way. I also wanted to demonstrate some of the trouble you might face if you want to picture the life and legacy of a traditional indigenous artist. An artist in the periphery that was central in his community then and is still central today. You must encounter colonial archives. You find a photograph here, a story there, comment in the police record so uh, there and here but you can still also sit down with uh, these young people the kids of his time and still unfold new stories about this life 
Many times it's, it is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But there is a story to be told here. The artwork of Nayan Bomi were all created in local context to educate people visiting his country and his, his children and grandchildren. But today, these artworks agency extend globally. This make me wonder, how is Nayan Bomi's legacy played out in the UK, in Japan, Germany, US and elsewhere, where we find his artworks today? on a pillow, in a couch, and so on. Yet it was Nayan Bormi who left us with the most amazing and important archive on the rock walls in Western Arnhem Land. And if you visit this place today, you will encounter more than 50 of his images on places that are open for visit to, to and, uh, admire his, his, his talent in uh, artistically. And as I also uh, trying to demonstrate very shortly, his artwork is still inspired his family and kin to commemorate his legacy in different ways. And I hope the work I'm doing now to create a biography of this traditional rock art artist will help to that in different ways. New artworks are inspired and continue to tell stories then handed down to him and that's thriving in, in Western Arnhem Land today. That said, it's also an urgency to save some of these artworks for future generations to enjoy. Some of them are decaying in a death rating in an alarming rate. There's still time to act here. And if you ask me, we all have a responsibility to save these artworks uh, because rock art is the most tangible artworks in the world which unfold humans' intangible strive to understand the past and present an emerging life world of indigenous people. And we can all lend a hand here, which I hope uh, we can do. And this presentation, and by exploring this in different research, is just one way to put uh, this central artist, not in the periphery, but back in the center where he actually belonged. Thank you very much for you. For zooming in. <laughs>